Europe has just put real money on the table for a capability that usually gets treated as an afterthought, the small aircraft that do the unglamorous work between peace and high-end war. Under the European Defence Fund 2026, the EU is launching a 15 million euros research and design initiative to define a future multi-role light aircraft, or FMLA, not a prototype, not a production contract, not even certification work, just studies and design. And that limitation is not a weakness, it is the point. Because before Europe can build anything, it needs to agree on what problem it is actually trying to solve. Start with the uncomfortable reality. Across European air forces, many light multi-role fleets are old, often 30 to 40 years old, and replacement decisions are drifting toward the 2035-2040 window. That is a long way away in calendar terms, but in aerospace terms, it is tomorrow. If you want a new platform in service by then, you define requirements now, you lock industrial cooperation early, and you keep the concept from fragmenting into a dozen national mini-programs that never scale. So, when the EU funds a formal concept definition effort, it is less about inventing a new airplane and more about forcing strategic alignment, common needs, common standards, common procurement logic, and a credible pathway that can survive political cycles. The headline comparison is telling. Defense Express likened the FMLA concept to Brazil's A-29 Super Tucano, a light turboprop aircraft designed to fight and train without burning fighter jet budgets on tasks that do not need a fighter. That comparison is not about copying Brazil. It is about acknowledging the operational niche, persistent presence, low operating cost, and the ability to deliver weapons and sensors where jets are either too expensive, too scarce, or simply the wrong tool. But Europe is not designing for jungle insurgencies alone. It is designing for a battlefield where cheap drones are everywhere, where electronic warfare is routine, where GPS can vanish, and where even low-intensity fights can include precision fires, man pads, and increasingly sophisticated sensors. The question is no longer can a turboprop survive. The question is can a turboprop survive long enough to matter while being cheap enough to buy in meaningful numbers. That tension sits at the center of the FMLA requirements. The EU is asking for a low-cost turboprop aircraft built for air-to-ground operations and specific combat roles. Light attack, drone interception, and close air support, plus direct support functions like ground targeting, ISR with combat elements, and forward air control in hostile environments during counter-terrorism missions. Read that again and you can see the logic. This is an aircraft meant to operate where the opponent's air defenses are suppressed, not where they are absent. That single phrase quietly defines the entire design philosophy. Europe is not pretending this aircraft will punch through a modern integrated air defense system. It is building something that can exploit windows of permissiveness created by higher-end assets and then loiter, observe, queue, coordinate, and strike at a fraction of the cost of keeping jets overhead. And cost is not a side note here. It is the operational enabler. In modern conflicts, the expensive part is not always the missile you fire. It is the flight hour you spend waiting for a target to appear, or the jet you dedicate to chase a drone that costs less than the fuel you burn intercepting it. If Europe wants endurance, numbers, and responsiveness, it needs platforms that can live close to the fight, operate from austere locations, and do not demand a pristine runway and a large maintenance detachment. That is why short takeoff and landing capability is baked into the concept and why the aircraft is required to operate from unprepared runways and in extreme environments. Sandy, dusty, salty, stormy, hot, humid, extremely cold, high winds, heavy rain, mountainous terrain. The FMLA is being framed as a modern conflicts aircraft, which increasingly means logistics and resilience first. But the most revealing parts of the brief are not the mission set. They are the survivability and systems requirements. The EU emphasizes reduced visibility to radar and other detection systems through coatings and related measures. It also explicitly calls for protection of onboard electronics against interference and damage from external electromagnetic fields, including electromagnetic pulse effects. Add electromagnetic compatibility, cybersecurity expectations, and resilience coatings for harsh environments, and you get a picture of what Europe fears most. Not just being shot down, but being blinded, spoofed, jammed, or electronically crippled at the worst possible moment. In other words, survivability is not only armor and flares, it is the ability to keep navigating and communicating when the spectrum turns hostile. That is why the concept also pushes work on operating in GNSS-denied environments and explores cockpit autonomy trends for single-pilot operations. Those two ideas are linked. If GPS is unreliable and the battle space is saturated with noise, pilot workload goes up, mission complexity increases, and human error becomes the cheapest way to lose an aircraft. 
So the FMLA study is implicitly asking, can we build a cockpit and mission system that makes a single pilot effective in a messy environment while still staying affordable? And that affordable constraint is unforgiving? Every extra sensor, every hardening measure, every software assurance requirement helps survivability, but also threatens the cost ceiling that makes the concept attractive in the first place. Then there is the industrial and political layer, which is arguably the real battlefield. The program is designed to avoid duplicating or fragmenting existing European aircraft categories, including turboprops and tactical military transport aircraft and their associated electronic systems. That line is more pointed than it sounds. Europe already has aircraft in adjacent roles, trainers, light transports, special mission platforms spread across national industries and procurement cultures. The risk is that multi-role light aircraft becomes a slogan that each country interprets differently, leading to incompatible solutions that never achieve economies of scale. So the FMLA effort is forcing convergence. Proposals must study one or two configurations, depending on what supporting states can agree on. Convergence is not just technical, it is political commitment in disguised form. This is also why the EU is stressing life cycle costs, maintenance costs, development timelines, and a formal preliminary requirements review as a milestone. In practical terms, Europe is trying to prevent the classic failure mode where a cheap aircraft becomes expensive through requirements creep, then arrives late, then gets bought in small numbers and ends up being neither cheap nor numerous. The preliminary requirements review is meant to lock a reference configuration that is technically feasible, industrially realistic and actually attractive to a market that includes both defense users and potential export customers. And exports matter here because the FMLA is not pitched as a purely military asset. It is required to be easily convertible for civil security and internal EU tasks like search and rescue and border surveillance, and it is also expected to support natural disaster relief missions. That dual-use framing does two things. First, it broadens the buyer base and strengthens the business case for production volume. Second, it aligns the aircraft with political narratives that are easier to fund. Crisis response, resilience, and security at home. In European procurement, that matters. An aircraft that can justify itself in peacetime budgets is far more likely to exist when wartime urgency returns. But the most revealing parts of the brief are not the mission set. They are the survivability and systems requirements. The EU emphasizes reduced visibility to radar and other detection systems through coatings and related measures. It also explicitly calls for protection of onboard electronics against interference and damage from external electromagnetic fields, including electromagnetic pulse effects. Add electromagnetic compatibility, cybersecurity expectations, and resilience coatings for harsh environments, and you get a picture of what Europe fears most, not just being shot down, but being blinded, spoofed, jammed, or electronically crippled at the worst possible moment. In other words, survivability is not only armor and flares, it is the ability to keep navigating and communicating when the spectrum turns hostile. That is why the concept also pushes work on operating in GNSS denied environments and explores cockpit autonomy trends for single pilot operations. Those two ideas are linked. If GPS is unreliable and the battle space is saturated with noise, pilot workload goes up, mission complexity increases, and human error becomes the cheapest way to lose an aircraft. So the FMLA study is implicitly asking, can we build a cockpit and mission system that makes a single pilot effective in a messy environment while still staying affordable? And that affordable constraint is unforgiving? Every extra sensor, every hardening measure, every software assurance requirement helps survivability but also threatens the cost ceiling that makes the concept attractive in the first place. Then there is the industrial and political layer, which is arguably the real battlefield. The program is designed to avoid duplicating or fragmenting existing European aircraft categories, including turboprops and tactical military transport aircraft and their associated electronic systems. That line is more pointed than it sounds. Europe already has aircraft in adjacent roles, trainers, light transports, special mission platforms spread across national industries and procurement cultures. The risk is that multi-role light aircraft becomes a slogan that each country interprets differently, leading to incompatible solutions that never achieve economies of scale. So the FMLA effort is forcing convergence. Proposals must study one or two configurations, depending on what supporting states can agree on. Convergence is not just technical, it is political commitment in disguised form. This is also why the EU is stressing life cycle costs, maintenance costs, development timelines, and a formal preliminary requirements review as a milestone. In practical terms, Europe is trying to prevent the classic failure mode where a cheap aircraft becomes expensive through requirements creep, then arrives late, then gets bought in small numbers and ends up being neither cheap nor numerous.
The preliminary requirements review is meant to lock a reference configuration that is technically feasible, industrially realistic, and actually attractive to a market that includes both defense users and potential export customers. And exports matter here because the FMLA is not pitched as a purely military asset. It is required to be easily convertible for civil security and internal EU tasks like search and rescue and border surveillance, and it is also expected to support natural disaster relief missions. That dual-use framing does two things. First, it broadens the buyer base and strengthens the business case for production volume. Second, it aligns the aircraft with political narratives that are easier to fund. Crisis response, resilience, and security at home. In European procurement, that matters. An aircraft that can justify itself in peacetime budgets is far more likely to exist when wartime urgency returns.